thank you. It's an incredible uh, honor to be here today as a new member and also as the uh, Scots Wards uh, Memorial Lecturer. And I want to publicly recognize Dr. Sirocco and congratulate him on being the uh, president of the Midwest Surgical Association uh, this year. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Uh, Woods. Um, it's really an honor to um, give the lecture in his name. Uh, Dr. Woods was a long-term uh, member of this association, as many of you know, had very deep roots uh, in Michigan, um, having trained here, lived here, practiced here, and in learning a little bit about him and the course of uh, giving this lecture, it's really an honor to give a lecture in, in uh, this gentleman's uh, name. So I gave a lot of thought about what I should talk about today. Uh, Bill gave me some wide berth, and I thought, you know, maybe I could come and talk about cholangiocarcinoma, but I felt like perhaps there may be a few of in the audience who didn't really care too much about cholangiocarcinoma. So I thought about something else I could talk about that maybe had wider implications. And what I'm gonna talk about today is about patient's expectations and surgeon's expectations. And I've given this talk a couple times, and I'm gonna frame this talk around cancer, because that's what I do, I'm a cancer doctor. But I've had surgeons come up and talk to me about uh, this talk after, after I've given it and said, no, this applies to my bariatrics population. This applies to my complex abdominal um, wall uh, uh, practice. And it's about patient's expectations and how they match up with surgeon's expectations when we are talking to them about operations. So. It starts, um, like most things, with a story. So this is a story of a patient that saw me at Johns Hopkins about seven, uh, eight years ago. A young gentleman, 45 years old, had a bad problem, had a left tonsil squamous cell uh, carcinoma, and was treated with a bilateral tonsillectomy, path revealed a T2 lesion, and he was treated with radi uh, uh, adjuvant radiotherapy. And then about six months later, I'm, you know, I'm a liver in a, uh, a pancreas surgeon, he came to me six months later and he had a liver metastasis. And uh, you can see that here on the arrow. It's a little bit subtle, but it's in the right hemi liver. It's kind of at the bifurcation of the right anterior and right posterior portal vein, clearly resectable. So not a technical issue, but more of a uh, issue, but more of a biological issue. This is bad news, right? This is squamous cell carcinoma, stage four metastatic to the liver, not a common indication for surgical resection. So I think I'm a a pretty uh, reasonable uh, guy. Um, he came with his wife, he had two kids, and we had a very long discussion uh, in the clinic. We talked about the operation potentially, we talked more in depth about the biology and his long-term prognosis, this being squamous cell and it being stage four disease. And I said to him, you know, we have to weigh the benefits and the risks of this operation. And then we had a conversation about long-term prognosis and my fear that even though we only saw one lesion in his liver, that indeed this may be the first uh, snowflake of a uh, snowstorm that we didn't appreciate yet. And I tried to set appropriate expectations. And after leaving that uh, conversation, I thought pretty good about myself. I thought I handled that pretty well, gave a good conversation, and, um, you know, and that was uh, done uh, fairly, uh, fairly well. Well, about three days later, I got a um, scathing uh, letter from the uh, patient's wife. And she told me that no uncertain terms that they came to me at Johns Hopkins because I was going to cure her husband. That he was 45, that he had two young kids, and that she didn't want to hear about any snowflakes, she didn't want to hear about any snowstorm, she didn't want to hear about prognosis. She wanted to hear that I was going to take it out and that I was going to cure him. So that got me thinking. That got me thinking about this whole idea of cure. And you know, in cancer, the C word used to be cancer. And now I would uh, posit to you that the C word now is cure. And I'm very cautious about using that word in my practice. And I'll show you some data to tell you why I'm very cautious about that. Well, you know, look at patients' expectations. It's not surprising, right? It's ubiquitous, ubiquitous in the media. No one talks about prolonging survival or palliating symptoms. We're talking about cure, right? We're going for the golden ring, the brass ring. It's everywhere in media, whether it's the published press, whether it's online, and this is what patients come into the door. And I would say the same thing with bariatric surgery, right? They don't want to lose 50 pounds or 75 pounds. They want to get down to being, you know, ideal body weight, you know, these over um, expectations. But how do we really define cure? You know, it's very challenging, you know. It's very kind of amorphous, what we may think of cure, what the patients may think of uh, cure. 
And it's a big issue, right? Because in the United States, two million people are diagnosed with cancer. And virtually every paper that you read from the 70s and 80s always starts off with the sentence that surgical resection offer, offers the best chance for cure, right? That's what the Medonc says, that's what we say in our conversations, say the best chance for cure is surgery. And traditionally in the literature, cure has been defined as five year uh, survival, right? If we look at most papers and presentations even today at most meetings, we talk about five year uh, overall survival. But is that really cure? I, I don't think so. That's what a, patient, what a patient is thinking about, right? Am I gonna be alive in five years? They're thinking, am I gonna be disease free and alive 10, 20 years from now. And the other problem with thinking about cure, especially in surgical uh, studies, it's very problematic from a methodologic point of view, right? It's subject to lead time bias, it's, it's subject to selection bias. So much of the data that we quote patients around this is um, very methodologically flawed. Now again, I'm a liver surgeon, I do most operations for colorectal liver metastases in the liver, and we've been very good about patting ourselves in the back, as well we should be, that over the last uh, 10, 20, uh, 30 years, we've significantly improved the overall survival for these patients. So I was a medical student and I got pimped about the five-year survival for patients with resection of colorectal liver metastasis. The standard answer was five-year survival, 25, 30%. Right, nowadays, the five-year survival for patients with resectable colorectal liver metastasis to the liver is about 55 or 60%. So that's amazing, right? a doubling of the five-year overall survival uh, for these patients. However, if you look at data from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group and other groups, the true survivors at 10 years is still only in the range of about 10 to 15 percent. And if you look at data from our group and other groups, patients are living longer, but of the 60 percent of patients who are alive at five years, two-thirds of them will be alive with recurrence with recurrence. So again, we're turning some of these cancers into chronic diseases, but are we really curing them? And how do we frame the discussions with patients around the expectations for their surgery in light of uh, these data? So how do we define cure? Well, um, the other thing, you know, I have a, a PhD from um, the Hobson School of Public Health, and we've been very interested in kind of doing more sophisticated uh, um, um, long-term survival modeling. And if you look at the most of the models that we use now for survival, it's called the mixed, mixed model. And the mixture is, is that you have some people who lived, they're alive, they got cured perhaps, and there's some people who died, right? But when you're a patient, you're not 50% alive at five years, right? You're either dead or alive. And so when you tell someone that there's a 50% chance of five-year survival, how do you extrapolate population-based data to the individual? And how do you figure out whether the patient is gonna be the mix of patients who were cured or the mix of patients who were uncured? So there's been um, some movement um, in the statistical literature to change the way that we analyze uh, data and to account for this heterogeneity. And there's these um, statistical modelings called uh, uh, basically a pure model. And what they do is that they, using some type of sophisticated statistical technique, is that we're able to kind of curry out, or cull out rather, the patients who were uh, cured. And if you look here, this is for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, another disease that I treat frequently. The overall probability of cure, these are based on uh, data from about 1,000 patients from around the world that we collected through an international uh, collaborative. So these are patients who were resected with curative intent, and the 10-year uh, survival, 10%, 10% for that operation. And the other thing to consider is not whether only whether someone's gonna be cured or not, it's also this concept of time. Right? So when does a patient re-enter the pool of the general population? So when telling someone that they are cured, right, can you do it at two years, five years, or 10 years, right? So we know in breast cancer now, I don't think anyone would say to a patient after five years, you're cured. We know that breast cancer is gonna recur longer and these patients need to be followed much longer. I think most of us now for colorectal cancer, for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, I never discharge someone from my care and tell them that they're cured at five years because these patients can recur longer than that. 
And this was a study that we did. It's an online web application. And what it looks like at is some uh, morphologic factors, such as tumor size, tumor number, uh, histologic type, tumor grade. And it tells the patient their probability of being cured, which you can see here, which is 25%, and then the time to cure. So here it's 10 years. So using these data, we can estimate that there's a 25% chance of cure, and it would take 10 years to get back into the general population risk pool for this disease. So I think we not only have to keep in mind the chance of cure, but also talk about the time to cure when we're having discussions with patients. And these are some data from the American Cancer Society, and we all know these uh, data when we look at 10-year, uh, five-year, and one-year overall survival. And some of the diseases that I treat, um, in particular pancreas down the bottom, has a particularly abysmal uh, long-term survival, yet I do a Whipple all the time. I, get one, I have one on next week, right? And, but we know that the chance of me curing that patient with that operation is uh, very, very uh, low. So that leads to this whole uh, idea of the perceptions of cure among patients and providers, and are there differences in perceptions of an understanding of potential cures and goals of care? And um, what is the um, impact of communication on this? And also, this is usually the time of the talk where like, someone throws a tomato at me and says that I'm dashing patient's hope, right? So this isn't about dashing patient's hope. It's about trying to figure out, are there other things to be hopeful about besides cure, right? And to kind of get into that ambiguous, messy area saying that, I don't know if I can cure you, but what are some of your other goals that I may be able to help you with? So it's not about dashing hope, it's about reframing hope in light of some of the information that we know to be factually true. So this is one of the articles that um, I came across when I started doing some of this research. This is an article in New England Journal of Medicine. And this was an article that looked at patients who had inoperable lung cancer and inoperable colorectal cancer, clearly not curable. And they asked a simple question. They asked the patient, why are you getting chemotherapy? And 70 to 80 percent of patients either said that they were likely or very likely to be cured by the chemotherapy that they were getting. So completely wrong, if you will. And what was more interesting is that this incongruity um, in the perceptions of the therapeutic goals of therapy was higher among minority patients, and also, paradoxically, it was higher among patients who ranked their physicians as great communicators. So if you look here, here are the data stratified by lung and colorectal cancer. Again, uh, 60 to 70 percent of patients saying very likely or somewhat likely that their cancer would be cured. And then if you look on the um, multivariate analysis, patients who ranked that their physician was a great communicator, 100 percent perfect score, were almost twofold more likely to have a misconception of the therapeutic goal. So this got us thinking that, you know, perhaps as physicians are we, dare I say, a little bit complicit in this. And I don't have time today to show you this, but we've looked at this, that it tracks along not only physician communication scores, but also um, patient satisfaction scores, and also how patients rank the quality of the hospital. That if they think that they are being cured, you will be ranked higher as a communicator, you will be ranked higher in your satisfaction score, and the hospital will be ranked higher in their quality. And I know as a surgeon sometimes I see this because I'm downstream from the medical oncologist, and the medical oncologists have told them that, you know, go see Dr. Pollock, he's going to fix all your problems. And they come see me, and I tell them a little bit different story. And then I get the, the nasty letter, and the medical oncologist gets, uh, you know, a Christmas present. And so this is real uh, stuff that it's tough to have these conversations, and sometimes um, patients aren't uh, quite happy about them. So what we did is I, I actually called the people up at Harvard. I said, I saw your paper. That's a very interesting study. Can I have your data? You looked at it in medical um, oncology patients. Come to find out, uh, I'm doing Whipples, and those patients have a pretty bad prognosis, and I'd be kind of curious to see what these data show for surgical patients. So we got their data. These, these are prospective data based on surveys of, of patients who have cancer. And we had about 4,000 patients who had surgery for either um, lung cancer or colorectal cancer. And perhaps you're not 
surprised that patients think that when they're getting surgery for colon cancer or lung cancer, it's even higher, right? Because you're getting an operation and 80 to 90% said, I'm getting this operation and it's gonna cure me. And even patients who have stage four disease, colon cancer or colorectal uh, or lung cancer, 60 to 80% said very likely or somewhat likely that they're gonna be cured. And again, if you look at the communication data, if they said their surgeon was a great communicator, it was more likely that these patients would say that the surgery was going to uh, cure them. So that got us thinking. Now we're like, well, two things could be happening. One thing could be the surgeon is a great communicator and the patient's not hearing us, right? Or um, the patient could be hearing us just perfectly and the surgeon is a horrible communicator. So how can we kind of get into that exam room and figure out what's going on? So what we did is that we started doing some surveys at Hopkins, because I was at Hopkins at that time, to look at uh, surgeons' attitudes and practices around discussing the chances of surgical cure. So um, here we had about uh, 200 people, surgeons, um, that we uh, interviewed. Um, and this was um, actually both at Hopkins, but also some other institutions um, in the city. You can see that the majority, 76%, uh, were in academic uh, practice, but uh, about a quarter were in private practice. And what we asked is some simple questions. We said, how often do patients specifically ask about cure? So how often do patients in your clinic ask about cure? And it was, very uncommon that it was never. So over, the overwhelming majority of times, surgeons said that, you know, the patients ask about cure. And then we said, how often do you actually use the word cure? Because I think that is a very powerful word. You know, when you say the C word, that I can cure you, there's a chance of cure. I mean, you can talk patients into a lot and they will accept a lot of morbidity or potential morbidity if you offer that C word, right? You say cure. And it, surgeons said about 50% of the time they actually use the word cure in their discussions. But then what's interesting is you said, when discussing treatment options, how often do you actually define what you need by cure? And I've given this talk to um, patients and I said, if the doctor talks to you about cure, your very next question should be, what do you mean by cure? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. What do you mean by cure? And it's interesting because about 50% of the time, that you know, there's never any conversation about what cure may mean in your mind and what it might mean differently in my mind. And then the other thing we ask is how often do you actually discuss a specific probability? So I think that's also interesting. When not only you talk about cure, you start putting numbers on it. In 12 patient, like I think there's about a 50% chance I'll be able to cure you. I think there'll be about 60% chance I could cure you. So you make it numerate. And um, about half, the, over half the time, um, they, um, act, surgeons said they actually talk about the probability of uh, patients being cured. Now, why, why is that problematic? Well, the next thing we ask is we ask surgeons, define cure for us. And it was all over the map, right? So here, a third of surgeons said the patient will not experience recurrence or cancer in his or her lifetime. A third said that the patient will be alive uh, without disease at five years and then 10% that the patient's alive and without evidence of index cancer 10 years after treatment. So again, you know, very heterogeneous what surgeons may mean when they discuss a uh, cure. The other thing is when talking about probability, how good are surgeons at estimating the probability of cure? So we did this study where we sent out a survey nationwide and we presented these stylized scenarios of different patients with different types of cancer. So the first example is a patient who has an adenocarcinoma, 2.5 centimeters with a suspicious lymph node. And then you can see uh, down uh, the different scenarios. And then we asked uh, surgeons to estimate the uh, five-year survival of those patients. And then we compared that to a meta-analysis that we did in the literature of what the data actually say the five-year survival um, may be. And interestingly, for pancreatic cancer, surgeons actually underestimated the five-year survival because we're probably so nihilistic that the surgeons um, said that the five-year survival was like 10%, where in the literature it's 20%. And then in other cancers, such as breast cancer, um, the surgeon overestimated the five-year survival. So we're not very good with numbers, right, of actually putting a number on this, yet we do it quite frequently uh, in the uh, clinic. 
So that has this whole idea of goals of care and, um, you know, these are the different goals of care and obviously cure is important, but there are other goals of care such as being comfortable living longer or achieving certain life goals. Like maybe I cannot cure you, but I can keep you alive to see your daughter get married next year. That, that is a goal that we can achieve. So talking to patients about these different goals um, are important. Um, that being said, you know, physicians perceive that most patients, um, as you can see here, that 60% want to be cured. So there's this perception on the part of the surgeon that patients want to be cured. We know that, so we kind of play to that in clinic because we want to give patients what they want, um, but at the same time, we kind of know that it may not be the most accurate thing. So the other thing that we did was that we um, looked at patients and providers' perception of cure as a goal of therapy by taking the patient and the provider. So this was, they had their preoperative conversation. As soon as it was, it was over, we took the surgeon to one room and we took the patient to a different room right after they had their conversation. And we just said things like basic questions. How likely do you feel that the surgery will cure this cancer? What are your expectations? And what you see here is that even immediately after that conversation, the patient overestimated, you know, 86% of patients said it was likely or very likely that surgery would uh, cure them, and the surgeons were at 72. But with regards to the complications, the surgeons had a uh, incidence of complications of 50%, where the patients had an incidence of 33%. So again, not surprising, the patient overestimated the benefit, underestimated the risk, whereas the surgeon kind of underestimate or at a lower estimation of the benefit and then at a higher estimation of the uh, risk. So these can be seen here in a scatter plot. And then the other thing that was interesting is that we asked patients compared to the exact same patient who has a similar diagnosis and stage, how is your chance to be cured compared to that patient? And patients said, my chance is better. So I can, this is kind of like the lottery ticket phenomena, right? We all know the odds of the lottery, but we all think we're holding the winning ticket. So we found that routinely patients would articulate things, I know pancreatic cancer is bad, I know the survival rate's 20%, but I'm gonna be the patient that beats it. And that may be good, I'm not, this isn't a, a value judgment, it's something that we just have to be aware of as we're having conversations um, with the uh, uh, patients. The flip side of all of this is, I'd say, regret. So the front side is hope, right? Patients making decisions about whether they want the surgery or not. The back end is regret, because there's nothing worse than doing a big operation on a patient who has cancer and having a 30% instance of morbidity, which we do in HPV surgery, and then the patient regrets ever having the um, operation. Because we know that regret is a highly negative emotion, and that it can be associated with um, um, depression. Um, and um, you know, there's nothing worse than having a patient who had a big operation, complications, recurrent cancer, and now they're obviously, uh, and then they're all, um, also depressed that they ever had the operation. So if you look at decisional regret, um, we asked a number of patients about their perception of the decision-making roles, and then we asked surgeons about their perception of their decision-making roles. And what we found, again, perhaps not surprisingly, is that when there is a um, incongruence of how the patient perceived they wanted the discussion to go preoperatively and how the surgeons performed that discussion, that decisional regret was higher. So in other words, if a patient wanted it to be more participatory in a real shared decision-making uh, model and that wasn't achieved, then regardless of the outcome, the patient had more regret about making the decision of having had the uh, surgery. And if you look at decisional regret, um, it tracks with anxiety. Um, these are some empiric data from our study. It tracks with depression, and it tracks um, with a worse quality of life. So it's extremely important that we're having these conversations with the patient preoperatively, that we properly identify what type of conversation that they want to have, what type of shared decision-making process they want to be involved with, and that we try to meet the patient where they're at to have these um, discussions so we can avoid this decisional regret. And then finally, the, the other part of regret is surgical regret. You know, I've had regret as a surgeon. I wish I never did that operation. 
they recurred three months later. And I kind of think a decisional regret on a wad continuum, right? And I'd say the person who has no decisional regret as a surgeon is like the cowboy, the cowgirl. And I've had work with surgeons who have said, they have cancer, they're gonna die anyways, let's give it a shot, you know? And then there's people at the other extreme who are very conservative. They don't wanna have any decisional regret. They wanna avoid any and all uh, complications. And there's a continuum of at least I tried to people um, you know, who really have been perhaps so-called so burnt in the past or have had a bad outcome and they wanna um, avoid um, taking on a lot of risk. So we looked at uh, factors associated with decisional regret among patients undergoing major thoracic and abdominal uh, surgery. And uh, what we did is, again, we uh, created some stylized scenarios. And when you think of regret, there's two sides to the coin, right? There's the um, regret of omission, like I wish um, I had, I, I wish, so regret of commission is I wish I had um, not done that. And omission is I wish I had done that. So there's some patients I wish I had done it, and there's some patients I wish I hadn't done it. And if you look, what we did is we took intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, because that's a disease that I'm um, interested in, and we looked at three different scenarios. So one scenario was a patient that had a five centimeter tumor, had one suspicious um, um, node, that, one node that was suspicious for metastases, had a single lesion, the second patient had a small uh, tumor, three centimeters, no suspicious nodal metastasis. But then this third case, this third case was kind of, you know, tumor bigger than five centimeters, had a suspicious nodal metastasis, and had vascular invasion. So when you ask surgeons, and we queried, I forget, maybe three or four hundred surgeons, in case one and case two, everyone said, I'd have regret if I didn't do the operation. Right, it's a pretty much a fastball down the middle, small tumor, maybe one lymph node have metastatic disease, but mostly node negative. But this third case, which is tougher, right, it's a bigger tumor, there's vascular invasion, it was split 50-50. Half the surgeons said they'd have regret of omission, and half the surgeons said they'd have regret of commission. And I think that's the other thing, you know, we all know this intuitively, that if you look for a surgeon long enough, you're gonna find one, right? Um, but this is the idea of like, where is our tolerance, you know, for regret as surgeons? You know, some surgeons will take this on, some surgeons won't. And I think patients frequently think that we're making decisions based purely on objective data. We are not, right? We are all living in kind of like, when was our last complication? You know, oh man, that, that case went horrible last week. Now my threshold is much higher. Or, you know, I've had a good run for six months. It's been, it's been great. You know, I'm living at large. I took out that cable tumor. It went great. Someone walks in my clinic. Let's go. This is great. My, my decisional regret titer is super low right now. Um, so I think that this is also working in the background as we as surgeons make decisions about what we're willing to uh, take on. So in conclusion, we wrote recently this um, article in uh, Annals of Surgical Oncology, um, A Singular Hope, How the Discussion Around Cancer Surgery Sometimes Fails. I, I sometimes regret that uh, title. It sounds like a, a Star Wars, A Singular Hope uh, title. But what we um, attempted to do was to summate a lot of this work that we've been doing over the past uh, seven uh, years and um, provide some very practical tools, largely for, I would say, house staff residents and um, junior faculty about how to communicate around some of these points that I've talked about today, about perception of cure, um, expectations around prognosis, and living in this kind of ambiguous space. And some of the um, um, practical uh, things I would mention is, you know, this idea of trying to avoid perpetuating prognostic misperception. Um, don't use euphemisms. I mean, I work with a surgeon who said, you know, after uh, pancreatic surgery, we got it all. We got it all. All right, that's a euphemism for, you know, you're going to be okay, where we all know that after a Whipple operation, even though I got it all, there's still a five-year survival of about 20%. Right, so we, we, can do, we can do better. We should avoid ambiguous language, and we should um, offer uh, treatments um, that um, are, um, um, that don't, don't think, like, a, it's not a fix, right? It's not, don't talk about fixes. Um, and try to really get down and um, um, avoid the um, Im ambiguous language, the euphemistic language. And the other thing that I think is um, coming up with scripts 
and working with uh, medical students and residents to really you know, work on the scripts beforehand and to invite them in t with you as a faculty member to watch you have these discussions. Because where do we model this behavior? Where do we learn this behavior? We're not taught this in medical school. We're not taught this a lot in residency. And we as faculty have to bring our medical students into the um, preoperative room and in the exam rooms and really model this uh, behavior uh, for them. So we're doing some other exciting stuff right now um, at Ohio State as we continue this research forward. And we're actually looking at doing some prospective work where we're gonna be doing interventions with um, physicians and surgeons and also doing some patient activation um, interventions with patients. And then seeing by activating patients and by educating physicians, can we change some of these outcomes around decisional regret, both for the surgeon and the patient, and then using some validated tools, we're all are also looking at whether with these interventions that we get greater alignment of um, therapeutic goals between providers and patients. And I think this is um, important work that um, I'm lucky that I'm able to continue to carry out Ohio State in conjunction um, with the Department of Surgery, but also with our palliative care team. So with that, um, I'll conclude. And again, I wanna uh, thank uh, Dr. Sirocco for inviting me to give this talk. And again, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be a new member of the Midwest Surgical Association. It's a wonderful association. It's an amazing uh, venue. And I look forward to uh, talking with all of you uh, later today and tonight. So again, thank you very, very much.